morning. Happy Sabbath. We have a lot of visitors today. And uh, although it's cold outside, can you feel the warmth here? Yes. Truly, it's wonderful to be in the house of God today. Uh, members, welcome. It's good to see all of you. And would you like to stand up at this time? If you're a member of Brahmani Church, stand up. I keep saying this. This is the people that makes this church go. Those who are seated are our visitors or they haven't decided what to do. But we want to specially welcome the Japanese Toronto Japanese Church who are in our midst. So go to those who are seated and welcome them. May the Lord bless us as we share God's blessing to us through words and hugs and handshakes. And if you have a cold, use your elbow. Today we celebrate Women's International Women's Day of Prayer. And we are so blessed to have the Toronto Japanese Church with us. Our speaker, Sister Lili Shibata, is, uh, she was invited actually by special events, uh, Sister Becky. And she brings with us the whole youth choir so we are truly blessed. Our speaker today, I met when I was involved with women's ministry. When I was going to Japanese church, which is for about a few months, I did not see her there. But when I met her at women's ministry, I was so impressed with her. She's always in all the activities, always volunteering. One day while we were in a I asked, because we were all resting, she continued working. And I said, Sister Lily, why don't you rest for a while? And this is what she told me. Nora, I have been away so long, I have to make up in my service for him. I turned around. I didn't want her to see the tears in my eyes. I thought, I never left the church, but how much am I serving my Lord? So I know we're in for a treat today. Uh, she's going to tell her story. Thanks.
the youth, the Japanese youth. One of them looks like a Filipino to me, maybe two. Uh, I want to acknowledge the presence of Jeff, Sally. Jeff is the husband of our speaker today. So we're happy that Jeff is with us. Can you please stand up? Thank you. Thank you for bringing uh, Lily, Lily Sally to us. And now, our Japanese Filipino. <laughs> You're all Japanese to me now. Sounds beyond the stars. <laughs> 
everybody good um, you know I'd like to thank Bramley Church for um, allowing us to come here to serve you to worship with you to share with you um, Be Auntie Becky has been asking me to come here for a while now and timing was never always right so we're really happy to be here to be able to share with you today um, so let's start um, my name's Lily uh, Shibata Sally uh, that's my husband Jeff we have no kids, so I have a lot of lessons built up inside of me that I want to <laughs> throw it at you guys and allow me to teach you some of the th uh, things that I've learned in my walk with Christ. Um, 
it's more of a lessons of what not to do more than what we should do. But I've learned a lot of lessons thanks to the grace of God, and I just wanted to share it with you. Um, but I wanted to start by talking about actually Sabbath school. Have you guys been enjoying this, this quarter Sabbath school? It's pretty good, eh? It's, um, it's about the great controversy, and I've been enjoying it so thoroughly, and I enjoy it so much because it has so much impact on what's happening in our lives today, as well as throughout history, as you know, within our Bibles as well, too. And it answers a lot of questions that, I guess, people who don't know God, who don't know what's happening around the world, they have these questions like, why are these things happening? And if they knew about this great controversy, they, that would answer a lot of questions. So I want to ask you something, and then you guys could answer me, but really short sentence, if, see how much you've learned about the great controversy. So if you're at work, or at, if you're at school for the youth, and somebody comes up to you and says, you guys go to that uh, Seventh-day Adventist Bramley Church, right? So you guys talk about this thing, about this great controversy. What is that? So with, without giving an essay or anything else, in short sentence, does uh, anybody have an, a youth? I already asked you this before at our church. So you guys here, how can you answer that to uh, somebody that you know? A couple words. Anything? Battle between evil and good. Very good. Anything else? Um, I had a theory, and uh, maybe you guys could let me know if I, I'm right or wrong at this. So when somebody said about the great controversy, isn't that um, somebody saying that God is... Um, God's here, and we know that God is a just and true God. Go to the next one. Just and true God, right? And he's a loving God. And Satan comes up and he says, no, he's not. He's a liar. Isn't that right? He said, Satan comes and he says, he's not good. He's mean. Look at all the stuff that's happening in this world, right? So is that kind of a little bit of a summary of what the great controversy is about? So God is true and loving, and you've got Satan that says, no, 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 he's a liar, right? So between good and evil. Um, so Satan's here for a thousand years trying to convince men and the universe of a false character of God. And he's using everything, if you learned in your lessons, by lies, deceptions, preconceptions, subtleties, compromise, to make you think that life's not fair and neither is God, right? And you can do better yourselves, isn't that right? You don't need him. So that's a pretty good summary of the great controversy, yes? Okay. So keep that in mind, and basically what's happening is Satan's trying to discredit God and his character. So that's one point. Another point I wanted to mention, and I'll refer to this later. Um, did you know that we were created to be jurors? You guys know what a juror is, right? In a court? Um, I got this from, uh, do you guys know Ivor Myers, the pastor? Oh, he does amazing sermons. And he has one sermon called The Blueprint. And if you guys haven't seen this um, sermon, you have to find it on YouTube. It's there all over the place. And it's an incredible, incredible look at the great controversy. So what he says is that angels will actually, uh, we will judge angels. Isn't that what the Bible says? It says in 1 Corinthians 6.3, it says, Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So Satan will be judged and will be witnesses for Christ. Is that right? In Ezekiel 28, 17 as well, it says, Your heart was filled up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you down to the ground. I lay before you kings, which means a judgment, that they might gaze upon you. So what Satan wants to do, and this is in my sermon, is that not only does he want to discredit God and his character, he wants to discredit you. And he says he wants to discredit you to say, you're not good enough to judge me, right? You're as bad as I am. You're a sinner. How can you judge me? So going a little bit further, a juror's qualification is little or no knowledge of the crime, right? 
So we weren't there when Satan had the fall. We weren't there about what exactly happened. Um, we must also be law-abiding citizens, you know, with the Ten Commandments. And we also must be able to distinguish right from wrong. And if you notice in our lives right now, things have kind of flipped. What used to be good is now bad, and what, used, what is bad is now good. Things have flipped around, right? So his ultimate goal is to discredit every single one of you when you stand up in court to say, you're not able to be a jury, you're not able to judge me. And he'll try everything to make you feel like there's no hope. He'll say, it's better just to get as much out of life now, do whatever you want, get what you feel you deserve, and when the time comes, he could say, you're not fit to be a juror, right? So there's two points, and I'll, I'll tell you why I'm going through this right now, and I wanted to start with this. He wants to discredit God's character, and he wants to discredit you and make you fail so you can't judge. So... If you don't remember anything about my sermon, I want you to remember these two things, right? So you have to pay attention because maybe it might test you. Um, but I really felt compelled to start off talking about this because it really took me a long time to understand this. It took me years to understand this. And it impacted my life so much, and it will impact yours if it's not already. And it fits into the bigger picture which I'll talk about. But if you allow me to pray again uh, for one second. Lord, please help me relay this message that you gave me from my life and from your lessons. Help me to be clear. Help me to be, hear your still and silent voice. And help me not to disappoint you. And reach out to those who know that need to hear this message. Okay, so I've personally experienced this controversy in my life. And uh, I've given my testimony a few times. So I pray that my home church doesn't get tired of it because they've heard it quite a few times. So I'm going to try to summarize. Um, I love the saying, you've heard this before, I'm far from where I want to be, but I'm so happy I'm not where I used to be, right? Much, and that applies to my life. So, um, I've, And I told this story to my church family as well, too. And it, it kind of, it's, it's a story that kind of described my husband and my, and my life. So bear with me. So a woman was walking down a road and sees this tiny, old, wrinkled man, gray-haired man in a rocking chair on a porch. He's looking so content and happy. He's rocking back and forth. And she couldn't help but just be in awe with this man, being in so peace. So she walked up to this man and said, sir, he goes, how are you able to be so content at your age? What's your secret? So the man said, well, I smoke three packs of cigarettes a day. I drink about a bottle of whiskey a day, and then I eat whatever I want. And the lady was amazed and goes, oh, my goodness. I hope you don't mind me asking, how old are you? He goes, well, 25. And so you kind of see where I'm kind of going with this, right? <laughs> All right, so those of you who don't know me, um, I was born in Okinawa in Japan. Um, that's that little bit there. Um, my parents both studied at the Japanese Missionary College in Japan, and my father was an SDA pastor in Japan. And he came to pastor, and he was a pastor at our current uh, home church. We were there, and um, of course now I'm a PK, right? Pastor's kid. <laughs> so you know what happens with that sometimes, not all the time, sometimes. But looking back now, I can see how this great controversy that I was talking to you about impacted my family as far back as I remember. I know my father was an amazing pastor. Everybody told me how great he was, right? He was actually asked to be a TV evangelist in the States. I remember that. But he turned it down, and perhaps maybe, um, I don't know, if things were different, and he listened to the Lord and went to the States. Things may have been different, so maybe that was a part of the great controversy when Satan's trying to discredit man, right? So I don't know. But anyhow, you all do know that when you have a strong Christian family, Satan hates that. He hates that so much. Um, but after my father served at the church, he took on a career as a psychologist. He went to Andrews to study that. And I'm telling you, our family started to degrade. And, my, and I know Satan started attacking my father in many ways. By the time I went to Kingsway, my parents split up. We had to move to a smaller home, and my mother supported us as we went to school. 
We tried to work to help financially. I worked at the woodwork and the binary. I ended up at the teaching and assistant kind of uh, in the English department. Um, but, at, but, while, but while I was there as well, Satan kept attacking. My father passed away from stomach cancer. And I think it was at that point when things started to slowly change. Um, one thing I do remember was my priorities definitely changed. And I started thinking, because I was watching my mom go through all this, that if I find a husband, anything can happen, right? And then so I, I decided I, I, I better become self-sufficient, get a good career, a good job, because in case I end up alone, at least I could support myself, right? So I hope you saw that little shift there. Instead of trusting in God, I started to forget about all that and start to rely on myself. It became more of a, what do I want to do? How can I succeed? What do I want and how can I do this? It was I, 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 right? Every decision I made wasn't in consultation with the only one who cared so much about me. And I completely forgot about that. Anyhow, by the time I was at Andrews, I met up with a couple of people. And even, yes, at Andrews, I felt like I was doing okay spiritually. I was going to church regularly. I was studying. Um, but there was always one side of me that wanted to do a little bit more. So with my couple of friends, we went out clubbing in Indiana. Um, we'd sneak out of the dorm. We, I started smoking in Andrews. Um, I already was drinking socially, and then so we went out, and you know, it had to do a lot with pride. Fast forwarding a bit, I quit Andrews, and I started working, and I started going further and further away from the church. And my relationship with Jesus started to be something on the side. It wasn't my priority anymore. Since I moved out and got my own place downtown, I basically stopped going to church and concentrated on my career and going out with friends. I was completely into the bar scene. And believe it or not, I was uh, actually going a lot to the gay bars because I didn't want a boyfriend, and that was the safest place to be. And, uh, but believe it or not, um, I ended up meeting some of my friends at Kingsway there, and they were gay. And I, but I felt comfortable thinking, I'm not the only one out in the world anymore. I have my friends here as well, right? So some right turned into wrong, and wrong turned into right. So I hope the subtleties there and I, I want you to remember as well too that things didn't happen like this overnight it took a while to do that so Satan puts thoughts in your mind that even if you start to do something that you feel is innocent and okay he'll use deception preconceptions lies that daily into your mind to condition you and subtly break you down so you feel it's fun it feels right but slowly his plan is to totally discredit you to be a juror. One of the main lies he put in my mind was that I've gone so far that God would never forgive me. For some reason, whoop, light up. So for some reason I thought, well, I'm going to burn forever. So I might as well just keep going. So that would be discrediting God, right? That's not what God's about. Again, with the great controversy, how Satan tries to play with your mind to break you down, and he wasn't finished with me yet. Um, you know, one of my favorite shows, and I quickly went there, it's a show called Lieutenant Joe Kenda. I don't know if you guys have seen this. He's an, he's, this is a detective about talking about all the cases that he's gone through. And I was trying to write this sermon on the Sunday, and then I kind of was hearing it on the side. And in a sense, I, I'm glad it, I, I listened. It was, he was talking about this stalker, and this guy was stalking this girl, and he ended up killing her at the end. So he was uh, investigating this crime. And then he described a stalker, and I, I want you to pay attention. He said a stalker's motive is that he is obsessed to possess He'll stalk the person they're after constantly until they break the person. He would call the victim, talking to her nonstop, telling them that they're worthless, they're sick, they're horrible, in so many words. And the stalker can't get it into their head that they'll never win. That's what Satan does. He doesn't give up, and he's obsessed to possess. And he won't stop until you're dead in faith, dead in hope, and dead in sin. But I told this to my husband, Jeff, and he goes, but wait a minute, you got to remember that God is obsessed to possess, to save us, 
Thank you, honey. <laughs> so he is. Um, anyways, I'm, I'm gonna continue on my nightmare. Um, then I met somebody uh, who moved in with me and I was with him for about four years. It's sort of great like relationships usually do, right? And things start changing. We were basically partiers all the time, you know, his biker friends, and we had a share of drugs and alcohol. And, but the worst thing about that relationship was the mental abuse and physical abuse. I had to call my brother a few times, and one time um, he came home drunk, and I didn't know what to do, and, you know, he'd be pushing me around and everything, so I tried to run away. Uh, so I ran down the hall outside my apartment. He chased me down. I tripped. And it was just in like, like a shorter t-shirt or something. And he grabbed me by the hair and he started pulling me back into the apartment. And I had rug burns and all this. And I went in and I actually grabbed the phone that was there and I just <coughs> whacked him over the head and knocked him right out. And then so, and I called my brother. He came up and we went to Golden Griddle till three o'clock in the morning saying, I'm going to call the Yakuza. Like, like I didn't even know if he knew <laughs> any of them. Uh, but, you know, my brother put up with a lot. Um, another time, um, uh, we were out partying again, and we were uh, upstairs in some apartment, and, and then uh, he was drunk, and I wanted to go home. He didn't want to, so he basically ended up just pushing me down the flight of stairs um, because he didn't want to go home. So uh, one of his buddies actually came down, picked me up, and he walked me home. And, you know, I just told him I, I just wanted to die. So what's, the, what's the point? Um, but he wasn't the only one that abused me. I abused myself, right? So... Um, there was a time where I was so drunk I'd black out. I wouldn't know how I got home or dressed. Uh, there was uh, that one time that we were at a bar and I was so drunk I had to go get some fresh air. So, you know, one of those uh, cement things that the car pulls up to? And so I sat between two of the cars and then I kind of passed out. I woke up and there was no cars there. So, you know, there, all, the, all these things happened. So I was abusing myself. And when you don't think that it could get worse, I got a call when I was at work from the police one day, and they said that, you know, um, he was in jail. And then so I started having to visit him, and that's actually the Don Jail. And over here, there's a landing thing up here. And every morning um, when we would go visit, it was, uh, the doors opened at 7 o'clock in the middle of the winter. It was freezing cold, and we'd always rush to be there first so we could get inside first. And I met so many women there, and it was, it was really sad because it, the lady that I got to be friends with a little bit, she was with me every single time. She was either number one or number two. I was the number one or number two. And she had all her missing teeth. She didn't have any teeth in her. And by the time I got to know her a little bit, she, the guy that she was visiting was the one who punched her teeth out. And she had a kid with her as well, too. And so, you know, and she felt like she was trapped as well, too, right? So there's a lot of sad stories. Um, but anyways, uh, there's a lot of other things that happened. And some of the, a lot of the things I did were so bad. I can't even mention it here because I was so ashamed um, with the s s things that I've done. Satan was continually working on me, pounding lies in my head that, you know, God just gave up on me, right? But I'd still talk to Jesus once in a while. You know, I'd be in the washroom and say, Lord, you know, I'm still here. I know you're disappointed in me, and I'm sorry. You know, that's about it. And then maybe a month later, maybe I'd say the same thing, right? Um, but the last time this guy physically abused me, he threw me inside the bathtub, and I, I covered my head um, with my arm, and then my arm became completely black and blue. Um, but by that time, it didn't matter, because um, if you speak to some women are abused or anybody that's abused, Sometimes the uh, physical abuse is a little bit better than the emotional abuse. Um, because the emotional, you know, the physical abuse, you know, you're going to heal, but the emotional one stays forever. And when a woman's abused, I'm telling you, we feel like the most ugliest thing on earth. We feel that nobody would, would ever want us, and we have nowhere to go. So I went into depression, and I started to consider committing suicide, and I felt very alone. And then I got excited about thinking about that, that you're not going to feel any more pain, right? So I was living at Victoria Park in Danforth, you know, where that subway, Victoria Park subway is. And then I kept thinking, I went out on the balcony thinking, um, maybe I'll jump out in front of truck. There's so much traffic. And then I started thinking about the driver. Oh, the poor guy's going to have to go to therapy because of me, you know. Oh, man, how could I do that to his family? And I thought, okay, well, maybe I could do it on my own. So I was on the 18th floor, and there was a concrete um, balcony, right? And then so I looked down from the 18th floor. I'm like... 
okay, well, maybe I'll, you know, I could jump and I lean forward a little bit to see if I could do it. And then I go back and I said, I don't know. You should feel the wind come up and I lean forward a little bit more and think, oh, maybe I could do it. I thought, what if I survived? Oh, my goodness, that would suck. <laughs> like, oh, my, somebody would have to take care of me my whole life. I can't do it, right? And then so I'd go to the Bible in tears, just pleading with God, just take my life, right? And, you know, and I'll take my consequences of burning forever. So, again, you know, that was basically discrediting God, isn't it? That's not how God's like. And that wasn't his plan. So after he threw me in the bathtub, my boss at that time saw my arm, and he sent me to Cleveland to work on a project to get away from him. And that's where I met uh, my Jeff. And uh, the day he met, I'm telling you, the day he met, and tell me this wasn't God said, he said, you're the girl I'm going to marry. And we got married three months after. Um, but you think my life changed good? <laughs> um, trust me, just the most wonderful thing that happened to me in my life, but it takes work some more than others, right? Um, and Jeff had his own past issues as well, and one day I hope he could come here to give his testimony as well. Uh, but in short, uh, we were getting deeper in drinking, uh, drugs, uh, partying, fighting. Most of the fights were, who's more sober to drive home, you or me? And we had that big argument. Uh, Jeff struggled really hard. He was on the harder drugs. He was on heroin and everything else, painkillers. Uh, you saw that commercial, I don't know, about a girl that was addicted to drugs and said, this is, uh, this is what happens when you're on drugs. She takes a frying pan and she just smashes the whole kitchen. That's putting it lightly. Uh, we had our struggles and our main priorities were drinking, when's the next beer, when's the next bag of Coke or whatever. Um, we go, we had a couple of Harleys, so you know, we were into that. Trying to meet bands like Aerosmith, so we went looking around at rock bands and met Bon Jovi and all those, all those famous people. And you know, we played hard and worked hard and we thought that's what life's supposed to be, right? So Satan puts you into a place where he says, look, you've gone too far, so you might as well stay here. So he says, aren't you having fun? Do whatever you want and be happy. You're lost anyways as long as you're having a good time discrediting you and God and trying to make you numb. He puts you to sleep and forget that there's a bigger picture. One time Jeff and I were at a bad place and he was high on something. And then I told him that um, it's like a flower. Let's see. It's like a flower. And I couldn't find a picture of a lily that represented this. I'm using a daffodil. Uh, so it's standing up, it's looking up, and then, it's, and then the storm comes, right? And then the water and the rain, it keeps hitting the flower and it starts to lean. The sun comes up and then it gets strength again. So the flower gets up again and looks up at the sun and gets stronger. And then the storm keeps coming and knocks it down. And each time the flower bends over more and more, the flower doesn't seem to be reaching for the sun anymore. And the storm comes stronger and stronger, so much so that it finally doesn't want to get or look up at the sun. And that's what Satan tries to do with us. He'll keep attacking us with all he has until we can't look up anymore and we start to doubt and discredit God's character. That's exactly where he wants us. So at the time of his judgment, he could look at you and say, look at this pathetic sinner. She has no rights judging me. Well, I'll tell you what I've learned, and that's when Christ comes in, my advocate, my redeemer, my savior, my best friend, right? And he comes and says, but you didn't tell everybody that hap what happened. She repented of her sins, and I died for her, and she's worthy to be a juror. Her sins have been wiped away with my blood, and she'll be you. So, now you see Jeff and I now. I thank my sister Grace. <laughs> Um, every time that God used her to inter uh, Grace, God used Grace so much to try to get me to watch that Doug Batchelor video, the prophecy code. And from there, um, Jeff and I got baptized. I got rebaptized in 2005. But this doesn't mean that Satan stops, is it? He tries harder, right? He gets angrier. Remember the stalker? He tried harder and I lost my job, but I got a better one. My brother passed away and so did my cat buddy. But I have a family that's closer. I have my church family and I have hope. Nothing 
separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And there is a happy ending and there is hope. There's life after this and all we have to do is a beware, be aware of the bigger picture. And it's not our short, sinful lives here on earth. We t tend to take our small daily problems and disagreements and we make it into huge life problems. It, it makes it eat, eat at us where there is a bigger picture. It's not always about us all the time. There's a spiritual war going on and we have to always remember that. Now I try to emphasize a few things in this talk, but one I wanted will destroy us. We all have it, we all use it. We all fall into it, and if we aren't careful and become aware of it, it will become our fall. Think of the wrong in this world by men, all the crimes, all the fights, all the bad decisions. There's one thing that stands out which causes this, and it'll be a destruction for all of us if we don't work on it. You know what it is? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15.31, I die daily, right? In verse 26, before that, Paul actually talks about the physical death. But in verse 31, he talks about another death. This is death to self, pride. And we talked about this in our Sabbath school lesson as well. This is actually from Jesus' teaching in John 12, 24 to 25. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls onto the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. But he doesn't mean to hate yourself. And a lot of people take that. They read it and say, oh, you know, I, I hate myself, right? That's not what he means. He's talking about pride. He who loves his pride in his heart will lose his life. He who hates pride in his heart will have eternal life. We have to look deep into ourselves and identify when we're prideful in our hearts. I used to work at Ernst & Young uh, accounting firm, and there was one of a, a partner, the senior partner. He was an old Jewish gentleman. And then he'd always, you know, I could hear him talking about what he's done. I've done this and I've done that, you know, and how great he is. And he, we go to the Christmas party, his wife's decked out in all this gold jewelry, you know, beautiful clothes, rings upon rings. And he actually sat down with me, he goes, so Lil, do you think I'm proud? You don't think I'm proud, do you? <laughs> you know, I sat there and, you know, I looked at him and go, well, yeah. <laughs> and he was kind of shocked and that just ended that conversation. But, <laughs> you know, we end up to be in a place where we're so comfortable that we don't realize how much pride has grown in our hearts. You think you have a handle on pride? Okay, so let's try driving in traffic when you're in a hurry and let's check your pride, right? I used to work downtown and I always took a subway, so I was okay. And, you know, Jeff's smiling at me already. <laughs> Sorry, I'm using it as a. Um, so, whenever somebody would cut my husband off, he'd get kind of upset, you know. And then, so I tried to comment, and I'm sure all of you can't relate to this, right? So, you know, I, say, I would say something like, you know, um, pretend it's your angel, you know, that your angel's trying to hold you back, right, because something's going to happen, or pretend Hannah, our little Hannah, is sitting right beside you, or, you know, the angel's beside you, right? And so I try to say these things to try to calm him down and ease it. Uh, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> but now, my new awesome job that I have, I'm like about 10 minutes away from the office, so I have to drive now. So I realize that it's not as easier said than done, of course, right? Somebody who cut me off, it's, don't you get that feeling in your gut? Go, how dare they cut me off, right? You have a weapon, you have a car, right? Um, let's tailgate them. You wouldn't do that, right? You wouldn't tailgate them to show them, you know, I'm right and you're wrong. Have you heard about road rage? Well, Jesus gave us an example of humility and giving our rights to someone even if they don't deserve it, right? He was wrong, but he kept silent and he bore our sins. He gave us sinners his rights that we didn't even deserve, right? How about disagreements we have with others? Isn't it because we feel right and if somebody doesn't agree, our pride starts to surface and instead of thinking about the relationship with that person, we start to emphasize how right we are and sometimes we're not even right. I learned two things we have to ask ourselves about when we strongly think about something, right? 
Is this straining or breaking the relationship with this person when you have these arguments? That you're so right? Or am I making my brother or sister fall or struggle in their spiritual journey, directly or indirectly? It may not be now when you're having this argument, but later on they might sink back to say, oh yeah, well, Lil says she's a Christian, right? And look what happened. So I don't need to be like one of those Christians. You don't know how it's going to impact people later on. Think about your last argument you had with somebody. Your family, it could be a church member, um, at work. Now think about this argument, and if both parties put their pride aside, how would this argument had finished? Maybe a little bit more loving? Maybe a better understanding of each other, right? Maybe a good compromise? I like what Pastor Bachelor said about rights, and you know, I always refer back to it because it actually, I remember this all the time. It was in one of his sermons, and he says, you know, um, he loves potluck. He smells the food. And he said he was, uh, you know, he was so hungry. The sermon was a little bit longer. And he went downstairs for the potluck, and he went in line, and he stood in line. And then he said, all of a sudden, you know, somebody's in front, and all of a sudden, their friends come over. And they say, hey, how's it going? And they end up being in line and pushing Pastor Bachelor back more, a little bit more. And he's like, I'm so hungry, right? And then so, you know, I, he said, he turned around, he goes, I learned one thing. He goes, you know, if we want to reflect Christ's character, take my rights. Go in front of me. It's okay, Right? Isn't that Christ's character? That's what he would do? Take my rights, right? So I can remember that. So I experimented, and I like to experiment to see how can I help my husband don't get so angry when he's driving. So I like to experiment and say, okay, what would work for me? So I remember what Pastor Bachelor said, and, um, and don't laugh. Um, so I hope any of you that maybe have this problem I'll give you homework, try it, see if it works. You could email me and say, yeah, that really worked out. Oh, no, that didn't work. Um, so this is what I do. This is my, my thing. I get in the car, and I do a quick prayer. I say, please keep me patient, right? Remember to give my rights to uh, another, you know, even if they're wrong, right, and bring me home safely. So I have this little prayer. Then I start. I start the car, and I go, be like Jesus, be like Jesus, be like Jesus, be like Jesus. <laughs> and I keep repeating it over and over until I get out of the, I get out of the driveway, right? And sometimes I keep going as well, too, right? Um, and then so when somebody cuts me off, and I'm like, please, go ahead and take my rights, right? <laughs> and I go, be like Jesus, be like Jesus, right? But actually, that actually calmed me down to say, that wasn't that bad, Right? It was hard at first, but this is what we call practicing Christians. We practice, right? We try to do this over and over. And, you know, uh, we run a depression prevention, depression prevention recovery program uh, by Neil Nedley. And that's one of the things we do is we try to do things to make it a habit, the good things, right? So maybe you guys could try it and see if it works. And then I want you to think of one more thing. Imagine if Jesus was driving and you were the passenger. I think some of you may be a little impatient with him driving. <laughs> I hope not, but he, I bet he would drive so carefully, right? He would give his rights to anybody, let anybody cut in front of him. And you're going to be sitting there going, I got to go, I got to go, I got to go. Come on, let's go, let's go, right? So, you know, just think about that. Okay, so let's go back to the great controversy, right? So let's recap. Satan is trying to discredit God, right? Satan is trying to discredit you. Pride was Satan's fall, and it'll be your fall if you don't keep it in check. And one more lesson. I hope I'm not overwhelming you with all these lessons, uh, but I do have one more, and it's, it's really important. Uh, Jeff and I used, uh, loves this show. It's, it's a comedy show called Everybody Loves Raymond. I'm trying to get Grace to watch it. <laughs> I don't know if you guys saw it. It's about a dysfunctional family. And there was one show where uh, one of the daughters was upstairs, and she said, what's the mean here? Right? And then the parents are arguing downstairs about what the meaning of life is and everything. And then the father picks up the phone, calls his, uh, I guess they're Catholic, the priest, and says, Hi, this is Raymond Barone. We just have a quick question. If you can get back to us and let us know what's the meaning of life and just leave a message, that'll be great. Thanks. Right? <laughs> and it's funny because, you know, why are we here? Right? Do you ask yourself that? And what's the purpose of us being here? And what is the will of God? So I can tell you in three words. Seriously. Be like Christ. 
Colossians 1.27 says, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. If we had Christ in us and we reflected Christ's character, everything will fall into place naturally. We'd be more patient, more loving, more caring. We'll give our rights to others, even if, even if you don't feel that they deserve it. Our small, petty arguments you know, we'll be in love, and even if they are wrong, it'll be more important to keep that relationship and find common ground and be a witness of God's true character. Now, to be able to do so, we need practice. Each one of us are in different parts of spiritual journey, and we talked about that in Sabbath school. And what I may, may need to work on may not be the same as you. God knows what we need to work on, and he'll send those trials to us over and over until we get it right. We'll see, though, he'll send those first was continually cutting us off until you say, brother, take my rights, go ahead. He'll give us, give us parents, and I'm talking about myself, um, you know, to give us patience, right? He'll send those co-workers stabbing you in the back until you say, God, whatever you plan for me, and you're allowing this to happen, I'll treat them lovingly, forgive them, that they can see your true character and perhaps influence them. So I've told a couple of youths, um, remember the story about Elijah? I think it was Elijah. They were surrounded by enemies, remember? And then his servant goes, oh no, we're gonna die, we're gonna die, right? And then Elijah prays, please open the servant's eyes. And what did they say? They saw thousands and thousands of angels all surrounding them, right? And for me, I, want, I always envision when, I, I, when I'm driving, especially in the summer, there's a lot of people walking back and forth on Sabbath, right? And we're driving home, and then I just imagine that, like, oh, man, if I could see what's actually happening, open my eyes and let me see. I could picture, you know, angels above everybody's head fighting for you. You know, the good angels fighting all the time. They're all over the place. This is a spiritual war, good versus evil. So what decision will you make? One small compromise will strengthen and encourage Satan's angels. One small piece of cake will turn into a quarter of a cake. John 17, verse 14 and 15. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from one evil one. So what this verse is saying is be in the world, but not of the world. So there was a question of what that means. When somebody is of something, that means that they're created by them. Isn't that right? I am of Japanese descent. I am of Philippine descent, right? I am of something. I'm created of something. So this is saying that you can be in the world, but you're not made of this world. The world doesn't make you. You are of God. You are his creation. He can, we can be in this world, but don't forget who we are, and don't let the world create you and change your character that was given to you by God. Mark 8, 36. For what is a prophet, for what profit is a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 1 John 2. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And one day, when all our characters care characteristics will be perfected in him, he will come. The last thing I want to read is Christ's object lesson, page 69. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifest manifestation of himself in his church. When the perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. It is a privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, where, where all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world will be sown with the seed of the gospel. 
Quickly, the last great harvest will be ripened, and Christ would come to gather his precious grain. Remember that you are of your Father, not of this world. Set your priorities, your goals, your future day by day by asking God what his will for you is. And know each answer will be, be like my son who I sent you as an example and put in Close our service, let us sing 311 in your church hymnal. I would be like Jesus. Please stand. Well done. 
loving Father in heaven, again, I thank you for this opportunity to worship together. And thank you for all the things that you've allowed me to go through so I could share it with those here and anywhere. And thank you for the lessons you've taught me. All good things happen as long as we have you with us. Lord, help us with our pride. There's so much of it. Help us be good jurors for you. Help us be worthy. Help us always to have you in our hearts Help us to look up to you for every decision that we make on what would Jesus do and help us to reflect your character that will reflect your Father's character truly. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall awake and shout. 